Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our Moment of Tooth webinar as part of the British Horse Society and the Equine Dental Clinic's Dental Awareness Week. I'm delighted to welcome Dr Chris Pearce and Dr Nicole de Toit, Directors of the Equine Dental Clinic and Specialists in Equine Veterinary Dentistry to join us this evening to talk about all of our horses' dental health and the importance of routine checks by appropriately qualified professionals. The Equine Dental Clinic is the largest specialist referral veterinary practice dedicated to equine dentistry in the world and they will regularly see cases from around the country with advanced severe dental problems, which they often find could have been helped many years before. Our joint aim through this campaign is to shift our whole approach and understanding of dental disease in horses and bring dentistry up to the standard our horses deserve. This is involving regular examinations, early treatment and preventative care, just like in humans. To support our campaign, we have created a new dental awareness pack, which can be downloaded via the QR code or by visiting bhs.org.uk slash teeth. If you haven't already downloaded your free pack, I would really encourage this as it contains lots of really useful information about essential dental care for our horses, along with your own free routine planner, which is an easy way to keep a record of your horse's dental checkups. Before I hand over to Chris and Nicole, just a couple of points to make around the webinar. We will be using the external platform Slido for any questions. So this can be accessed online at slido.com. And if you use the access code BHS, um, we'll get, be able to see all of your questions and these will be answered at the end of the webinar. The whole session will also be recorded and circulated after the event to rewatch. I'm now pleased to hand over to Chris and Nicole for our Moment of Tooth webinar. OK, uh, fantastic. Can you hear us OK, Gabby? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. OK, so um, thanks for the introduction, Gabby, and um, thank you so much for inviting us to to do this and also for the support from BHS for this Dental Awareness Week and the whole campaign of No Pain Check Again. Um, it's been a it's been a fantastic campaign and the week I think is going really well and hopefully we'll be able to repeat it in future and it'll become a regular fixture. Um, it all really started from um, the fact that we are doing referral specialist dentistry every day and we found, as you said, so many cases literally day in, day out. We see cases with really advanced problems. Uh, which could have been the easily treated if they'd only been spotted right at the beginning of that process. And I think it started from a welfare, the BHS Welfare Day that I came and was invited to lecture at a few years ago, where I did two presentations and showed some pretty gory videos. Some of them are on here tonight. And um, I think it was from that that made the BHS think, well, actually, no, this is a welfare issue and we really should be doing something about it. So that was sort of started the collaboration. And I'm just so happy that you know, we're going to hopefully help more horses by doing this and bringing the whole sort of dental team together um, and sort of sharing the common goal of trying to improve the standard of dentistry. And I think we've even got some people online from Australia and some from France and other places around the world. So hopefully this kind of awareness campaign will spread and uh, might even be replicated throughout other countries. So um, I just better let Nicole say hello as well as she's yeah. here. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, just really happy, you know, um, you know, it's kind of always funny to say, but we really are passionate about teeth and about horses and dental health really, and what we can do to help them and just yeah, raising awareness of the importance of it and what clients should be expecting for their horses when they're getting dental treatment. Yeah, so, okay, so what we'll do now, we'll go into this um, presentation. So I'm going to share my screen here and let's just check that's working. Can you see the screen there? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay, okay so this is the, this is um, our webinar, the moment of tooth. Um, and we're just going to start off looking at um, this slide, which just shows our practice. 
And you can see from this image that right from the beginning, we did this 10 years ago, uh, you can see that the sort of standard that we're trying to achieve in dentistry is something that's much more kind of commonly recognized in human dentistry, the sort of image of a very close inspection, actually doing a filling procedure in this in this image. But it just sort of conjures up an image which hasn't really been the image of equine dentistry um, historically. And other subjects in equine veterinary medicine have moved on so much. We've been doing CTs and MRI scans and complex surgeries for other areas of the horse with lameness and all sorts of other um, sort of very advanced techniques and treatments are done these days, stem cell therapies and things. But dentistry seemed to just not really be moving on that fast. But thankfully, there's been some fantastic research done through various universities, especially Edinburgh University in the UK and Scotland. And um, through that, from Paddy Dixon and some other workers are as well, of course, around the world, there's been a real renaissance in dentistry in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, really. And um, I think this image sort of conjures it up very nicely where, where, where we are now. And that's very different to where we were 20 years ago or even, um, even 15 years ago. So um, this is us, there's uh, Nicole and I, and here we are uh, teaching um, in China at the World Equine Veterinary Association Congress a few years ago. And again, this was really part of a sort of educational experience for the Chinese to try and demonstrate to them uh, the benefits of good dental care um, and actually good veterinary medicine all around, really. It was a multi sort of subject um, conference. Um, and we're both specialists in equine dentistry and specialist means that we're recognized by the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons as specialists, which means we have a diploma in equine dentistry. And I've put at the bottom there that that means we're kind of at consultant level, really, and if you equate it to humans. And in the US, they call that board certified. So it's kind of, but we'll come back later to the sort of team and the importance of everybody within the team, not just um, specialists like Nicole and I. Um, we also should mention we have Richard in our team as well, Richard Reardon, who is based in Scotland. He's um, not able to join us tonight. Then we do have um, others in the team, and you'll see that um, in the middle there, we've got an image where we're teaching, and we've got um, a chap there who's come from Japan to learn to do dentistry and to take that back home and uh, to start trying to do high quality dentistry at home. So we're really passionate about education and teaching other people to sort of raise the standards as well. Now, I put this on, I don't know how many of you are on uh, our Facebook channel or on the BHS Facebook channel, but this was a video that I shared today. And I said, um, it, write your comments down. What can you see? going wrong in this horse's mouth or what kind of problems can you see and to list them down and we had some interesting comments I'm going to go through this a bit more later on actually when we show some case examples but there are a number of things that we can see here we've got some cavities in the teeth here we've got some big overgrowths of the teeth here and also on this other side up here we've got some very unusual or fairly unusual staining here on one side of the mouth that's not on the other um, and we've got some other changes going on with the bottom teeth. But as you'll see when we talk about this case later, the fact that these teeth are overgrown means these teeth are completely out of balance, and it means that there's something missing or something broken or something bad going on down here. But of course, you can't see that from just looking in the mouth. And you'll also notice from this view that there's no food in the way. The horse is very still, and we've got a very bright light shining in the mouth. So we're really kind of illuminating the oral cavity and starting to look and unfortunately for many many years dentistry has been performed without really even looking in the mouth it used to be quite sort of standard just to have a feel around um, and then do rasping with a hand rasp but this this pony amazingly is not really showing any symptoms or clinical signs at all this is a completely normal horse um, little pony actually and he's behaving pretty well and he's in pretty good body condition and it was only a routine check um, that that identified these problems so we'll talk more about that later but that brings into um, brings into the discussion this whole problem and the whole reason that we've done this campaign and the reason that the BHS became involved from a welfare aspect and why we call it no pain check again because when you start to look at what this pony has going on in the mouth it's 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 totally illogical to think it couldn't be painful 
it just has to be painful, the problems that are going on. So why why doesn't the pony show symptoms? Why hasn't it been dropping its food? Why hasn't it been um, depressed? Or why haven't there been any other problems? Why haven't it had performance problems? All the things that you might expect. So that's going to be a real focus of this talk, how it is that horses disguise their sort of symptoms, if you like, or their clinical signs, as we call them. And why is this campaign called No Pain? Check again. OK, so let's move on then from there and we'll come back to that later. Oh, no, it doesn't want to move on. That's funny. OK, I'm actually going to show you another little case example now, a little pony that came to us called Bandit. And again, same theme. Uh, this pony you can see on the left image there, you wouldn't really know there's anything wrong with him if you just looked at him from a distance. He's eating fine. Um, he's got a lovely um, long shaggy mane. He's got nice coat. He's in very good body condition and pretty normal. But the owners did notice eventually that he got this big swelling under his jaw on his left side. And on the image there on the right, now that it's been clipped, you can see that there is indeed a big old swelling um, under the back of that jaw. Now, if you see an image like this, which is a really nice image, sun setting in the distance or whatever, this means there's not such a nice image coming up. So if you're of a slightly nervous disposition or don't like seeing anything gory, then you can look away now because I'm going to show you what we actually did with the bandit. So he's sedated here and he's got his head resting on a headstand and I've put local anaesthetic all around um, this um, abscess and we've done a nerve block to his whole jaw. So that area now will be completely numb. And this is a little video showing uh, what we've done. You can see the skin's turning all black and it's pretty nasty. And there's an area there you can see it's very soft and it's pointing. And so he's make a little incision into that. He didn't feel that at all. And now you can see the pus draining out from this huge abscess that he's developed. So he's only a young pony, I think he was a four year old. And he got a big abscess there forming from an infected tooth. But he amazingly, even with that massive abscess full of pus, he was actually in pretty good state. He was eating pretty well and um, or very well and didn't the owners didn't really notice there was anything wrong until they felt the big swelling. So we had to extract the tooth and this sort of leads on to sometimes how difficult these things can be. Um, and the tooth here was too big to come out through in the mouth. So you can see it, the tooth is extracting, um, extracting the tooth at the top there and it hits the row above and that won't fit out because it's so big. So we have to start cutting it and we also have to drill a little hole into it, secure it to stop it falling back in the socket, cut it off and then we can remove the whole thing. That was all done with him standing in the stocks. The procedure took about uh, 45 minutes to an hour altogether. Um, but there it is. Now the tooth's all out and then that will heal up and then um, he'll be a nice happy pony again. But it, it's just incredible to us and it, it, it sort of never ceases to amaze us how many cases we see like that where they don't seem to be showing the clinical signs and the signs of pain that you would expect. And again, just an image here, just a, of course, we've got thousands and thousands of images like this. This is an image where the cheeks are obviously very ulcerated and sore from some very sharp points that are developing on the side of these upper cheek teeth on the left side of the horse's mouth. Um, and again, it's it's just incredible how horses will develop these with sort of the minimal signs of, of any kind of pain. But that doesn't mean they're not in pain. So the first thing we're going to talk about in this presentation now is do horses feel pain? We're going to go on to some dental anatomy. Nicole's going to take us through some of the basics of anatomy. Then we're going to run through some of the more common diseases and problems of teeth that horses get and the things that we kind of um, encounter more commonly than others. Then we're going to discuss the dental team and how and why we should all work together, um, how it works with sort of referrals from one person to another. Um, and then a little bit about modern treatments, what we're doing at the sort of veterinary end. And then we're going to have a summary and we should have for half an hour or so for questions at the end, which Gabby's shown you how to send through to us. So how common are, is dental disease in the horse? Now, don't worry too much about all the small print there, but just look at the bottom there. You can see that the overall prevalence or the overall sort of occurrence, if you like, of dental disease in horses. And this has been from veterinary clinical studies looking in horses' mouths, not just horses with dental problems, but just a random selection of horses. And we find incredibly that 
um, over 15 years of age, we have up to 96% of horses that have dental disease that they would benefit from uh, having treated. And under 15 years, that figure is 70%. So it's still incredibly high. And one interesting study there, um, well, two of these actually are interesting. One as a study in an abattoir of horses in Australia showed that 97.5% had dental disorders in the age groups 11 to 15. And another one here from the UK, uh, published in the Equine Veterinary Journal, just looking at 200 horses um, doing a proper thorough examination, found that 95.4% had dental disorders. So that shows us that this is a common problem, a very common problem, and it's really up to us to identify it and the best way to help these horses get these things treated as soon as we can. So do horses feel pain? So this is one thing that we hear time and time again is, oh, well, horses don't feel pain like we do, so therefore they probably don't, you know, they don't really feel these problems that they're getting in their mouths like we would. Well, you know, if we go back a few hundred years in the histories of human medicine and dentistry, then dental pain was absolutely debilitating and there were really no treatments other than extraction of your painfully, um, sort of cripplingly painful teeth with usually whiskey or something similar as an anaesthetic and they just pull it out. And, and most people by the age of 40 or 50, um, if we go back 50 to 100 years, um, most people by the age of 40 or 50 did not have any teeth because they would have all been extracted or broken. So actually dental disease in humans has been you know, transformed by modern dental care. But horses definitely feel pain. You can see this image on the right of all the nerves that come through. And there's a lot of nerves supplying the teeth in the horse's skull. And we definitely know that they uh, will um, transfer pain reactions and responses from the tooth. And those nerves come into the root of the tooth here. This is an upper tooth. And, and then they, the nerves travel down through these structures, which are the pulp canals. And Nicole will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I'm not actually on the anatomy yet, am I? I'm still in the introduction. So, um, and just to show the level of ignorance. Now, this is a website that I've checked this just a couple of days ago, and this is still published on this website. It's in the USA. And you can see this is um, an image. Somebody's examining a horse on the left, not in a very good way, we would say. And on the right, they're using a motorized para instrument to rasp the teeth. And on the left, you can see it says on the website, horses teeth have much more crown than human or dog teeth. So they don't feel the heat from grinding like we do. And then on the right, you can say, see that he's saying, oh, look, there's smoke showing. Complete and utter ignorance and um, just astounding, really, that there are people out there that think that horses don't feel pain on their teeth like we do and that you can burn horses teeth with an instrument and get away with it without causing harm. And I can promise you, you can't. That will be debilitatingly painful in many cases and will risk killing the teeth. So that is something that we need to carry on with our education. That's why we're doing this, try and spread it as far and wide. And then at the other end of the scale, we've got just neglect of teeth where they're just not rasped properly at all and horses are left to their own devices. And people often say to us, you know, what happens to horses in the wild? You know, they don't get modern dentistry. They don't get their teeth rasped. How, how do they survive in the wild? Well, here's a little Welsh pony that's been surviving in the wild without any care. Sorry about the... So, <laughs> I should turn the sound off, shouldn't I? That one. But um, you can see this little pony's got enormous, enormous overgrowths and steps and waves. And what happens in the wild? The average lifespan of a horse in the wild is about 12 to 14 years. Um, and there'll be various reasons behind that. They also don't get treatment for Cushing's disease. They don't get treatment for lameness. They don't get treatment for colic. They don't get any treatment. Um, and it's really a case of survival of the fittest. And you die, live fast and die young when you're living in the wild. So, you know, I think that that's something we we shouldn't dwell too much on. But what I think we do need to look at is what, you know, what about this business of what are the signs of dental disease in horses? So if we go and do a Google search, we put signs of dental disease in horses into Google, and we'll see that it says halitosis, so bad breath, dropping food, reduced appetite, slow eating, feed packing in the cheeks, food in the droppings that's not digested, weight loss, 
these things have come up time and time again and if we do sort of questions at courses and conferences and owner education client evenings this this is the things that owners always tell us and yes we do see ones like the horse on the left that's quitting it looks like it's pretty old and it looks a bit thin and it's quitting so a lot of people would say yep that looks like dental disease sure enough one in the middle with pouching in its cheeks pretty unusual to see that but quite an impressive image uh, I think that one's from Paddy Dixon, Professor Dixon at Edinburgh. And then a horse on the right that's just dropping all of its food. And this horse is just actually transplanting all of its hay from inside to outside of the stable. It's actually not got dental disease. It's actually got a neurological disease, a nerve problem. It can't swallow. So it chews the food and instead of swallowing, it drops it out of the mouth. So actually that one, although it's a good image for this presentation, it does not have dental disease. So what about weight loss? This is something else that comes up time and time again. Surely horses with a bad dental problem would lose weight. So here is a pretty sad video of a horse that was sent to us as a referral. It came up from the southwest of England from a rescue centre. And the history was that it had a broken tooth. Um, and the uh, place where the horse was extracted from said that the reason that it was so thin is because of the broken tooth. So we'll have a look at this poor horse coming out here now and um, well you can decide for yourselves do you think this is a case of a bad tooth or do you think this is just a case of pure neglect uh, from somebody who should frankly be uh, arrested for this um, and, uh, and, and definitely the latter this is a case of malnutrition starvation neglect is covered in rain scored you can see mud fever all up the legs and it's painfully thin it's kind of got a depressed and very slow demeanor to it uh, because it's you know not far off collapsing from weight loss and we put it in a stable and we gave it some hay and we got ears up and we got lovely chomping noises this horse is eating completely fine he did have a broken tooth he had a broken corner incisor which was not affecting him in the slightest so weight loss is usually from something other than dental causes of course you can have weight loss from severe dental problems but actually the vast majority of horses do not have weight loss when we see them even with fairly advanced disease so how do we know that horses are in pain and how do we assess pain well we might see swellings of the face and we might see other telltale signs but actually quite incredibly quite a lot of horses just don't seem to show anything and we did a little study of horses that come to us by referral. So these are horses that have been identified as having really advanced problems, fractured teeth, sinus infections, all sorts of things. And in our little study, we found that um, this was actually not that small a study. This was 500 horses that came to us. We found that 62% of them, when we asked the owners, were there any signs like weight loss or quitting or anything like that? 62%, so way more than half, said nope. There were no signs the horse was performing well it was eating well it was in good condition but when my dental technician vet whatever examined the mouth they found a broken tooth and an ulcer on the cheek or something nasty or a sinus infection so that's that was that's quite incredible and that's really why we're here trying to get this message across that please don't wait for the horse to start to show clinical signs because then it may be really late so we we definitely need to rethink this whole idea of clinical signs with dentistry. So what signs does a horse show us if they have pain? Well, on the, on the left, we've got severe pain. And that can be a really sad, obviously a very sad thing to see. This would be a horse, for example, with a, a twisted gut, a nasty colic, a rupture of the colon, something awful, and they become completely depressed, trembling, sweating, um, lying down, and obviously won't eat. So that's severe pain, moderate pain. We often get this pain face and you're probably aware there's been a lot of research on the different faces that horses express when they've got mild to moderate pain or even severe pain. And they've often got this sort of ears back, dejected appearance, tight muscles around the eye and eyelid. Um, commissure of the lip is often tight, nostrils a little bit flared and tight as well or compressed. And they'll often detached from the herd. They'll often sometimes become aggressive. They may be inappetent. And this is the kind of more moderate to severe pain. But mild pain, and also in mild pain or intermittent pain, that can be really difficult to identify. Might present as poor performance. They might be a bit depressed. They might just not be themselves. But you need to know what normal is to know that the horse is not normal. So if you've only just bought it recently and it's a bit grumpy, 
you might just think it's being marish or something or it just doesn't like working um, and these can be very difficult to identify and we think that a lot of dental cases will be in this category because they're often long-standing diseases of teeth and it's often causes long-term sort of mildish pain for the most part so a little case example here a racehorse that's in training it's developed an infection um, in its sinus it has a sinusitis it's actually already had sinus surgery 12 months before so this is a recurrence of the sinus infection on the right side you can just see a little bit of um, nostril pus a little bit of pus coming out of the nostril there and when we watch him in his stable or just poking his head out from the stable he keeps doing this behavior where he's sort of pulling up his lip on the right side and sort of, sort of just jostling his head up and down now a lot of people might say that that's you know not that I think it was passed off as normal for a racehorse in training because we all know that they can be a little bit on edge and they're often fed a lot and they're kept in their stables a lot not ideal management a lot of us would say um, but that's life at the moment unfortunately if you're a racehorse so they do develop these stereotypes or these kind of abnormal behaviors when they're in those conditions so that's what this was passed off at but as we watched him he kept on just pulling up the right side of his cheek so these kind of things can be signals, but of course, um, and, and many of you I'm sure will know the works of Sue Dyson, and Sue Dyson has developed a ridden horse pain ethogram, um, which gives us, sorry, Gabby, did you? No. So Sue Dyson's ridden horse pain ethogram is a way of assessing the way a horse is performing and the sort of aberrant or abnormal behaviors that it's showing and then it gives you a composite score to decide whether or not the horse is likely to have a musculoskeletal problem. Um, not really anywhere during any of the research uh, papers does it discuss any other pain, for example, dental pain. Um, so that's something interesting. You know, we, we see a number of cases that behave like this, that do have dental problems, but of course we're very aware that Probably a lot of them do have musculoskeletal problems, but we mustn't ignore the fact that it could be could be the teeth or it could be the ear or it could be the eye or, you know, there's obviously any other parts of the body systems it could be, but the dental dental pain would be one of them. Another little case just to demonstrate the point, another one with a facial swelling, another young horse. This is a very fat cob called Stanley and Stanley had big bony hard swellings on both sides of his jaw. And he also stank because there was a little hole in the jaw where pus was coming out, which was stinking. Um, but he is fat and he used to belong to some of the traveling community. And um, he was then sold and the new owner wanted to know why he had such a horrible smell. Um, and I'll show you what he had a bit later on. So we keep on seeing these horses really that the owners tell us are fine. They say there's nothing wrong. And they do seem to be hiding the problems that they have. Here's another one. Whoops. <laughs> so this chap um, is the thoroughbred who's hunting twice a week and his owner is convinced that there is nothing wrong with him. He's performing um, his duties extremely well. She states that he eats completely normally, um, but the dental technician who went to do the routine dentistry noticed a big problem with his incisor teeth teeth and said you really 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 need to get a specialist opinion on this and get this worked up and hopefully treated so this is the video um oh dear come on video this is the video of me giving him a carrot the sort of famous carrot test so you'll see um he sort of goes for the carrot he's very interested in it he looks pretty happy to get it but he is not going to bite through it and you'll see he's moving his head in all sorts of different positions now he's actually broken it off there he didn't bite it he's very clever and I try the other side of his mouth, but he's really just sucking on it. So I give it to him and then he takes it in with his tongue and he thumps it away nicely with his cheek teeth because his cheek teeth are completely normal. When we look at his incisor teeth, we can see that they've got a very, very nasty disease called EOTRH. And the long name for it is printed at the top there. And Nicole's going to show us a bit more about this nasty, debilitatingly painful disease later on. And we're going to explain to you why some of these horses actually seem to be coping pretty well. Um, but I can tell you one thing, they are remarkably improved by having these teeth removed when they're in this state. It's quite incredible how well they do. 
So here's another lovely little picture. Um, suggests to you that there's something a bit more nasty coming up. So this is the horse having all of the incisor teeth removed. I'll move on swiftly to show you the actual teeth. Some of them were broken, some of them weren't, but they're all very badly diseased. And now here's a video of not him, actually. It's a different horse that's had the same surgery. Had all of the teeth removed, the incisor teeth. And he's six weeks later, he's grazing out on the pasture. He's very happy. And as he comes under here looking for some longer grass, you can see he's got his gums there. So he's just sort of biting the grass with his gums. And it's all healed up. The little square on his face is where we did a nerve block. So uh, these horses do incredibly well. It's a big psychological barrier for owners to go through, much more so than it is for the horse, to um, agree to have these teeth removed in these cases. But they, they really respond incredibly well. And there's a huge transition. And the owners then understand that actually what they thought was normal for the horse actually wasn't. It was just that the, the horse was in low grade chronic pain over a long period of time. OK, so I'm going to pass over to Nicole now. She's going to take us through some essential anatomy so we understand what we're looking at. Right. So I think anatomy um, with any kind of subject is really, really important because it forms the basis. And it's really important for us to be able to recognise what is normal in the horse. Um, and if we don't understand the anatomy, we won't understand the disease processes and how the disease processes may affect the horses. So Chris has already pointed out to us, this is an example of some teeth, that we know that the teeth um, do have a blood and a nerve supply, and this is su supplied in the form of pole pawns. So when we're looking on the surface of the tooth, we can actually see the secondary dentine that protects the pole pawns, that overlies the pole pawns. But when we're looking inside the mouth and we see a defect on, on the surface, as you can see with the picture, with the um, endodontic file, that endodontic file has gone inside the tooth, which it shouldn't do because a healthy tooth should have should be sealed on top. That endodontic file will potentially be communicating with the pole pawn and the live part of the tooth. So we know that when we're looking at the surface of the tooth, there's a lot more going on underneath the surface. So when we're looking inside the mouth, when we're doing an oral exam, um, yes, we can see um, the, the obvious diseases like a fractured tooth, um, as in this example, and other things It can sometimes be obvious. But we've got to remember when we're looking inside the mouth, we are effectively seeing the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot more to the tooth than just the clinical crown that we can see in the mouth. Now, horses' teeth are a bit more complex than ours. Um, we are brachydont, so our teeth are more simple crown system. So we have a crown and we have a root. And the teeth that we have, our adult teeth, when they're up, that's the teeth that we have for the rest of our life. Whereas horses' teeth um, are hypsodont. So hypsodont means that they're high crowned. And even though they have the same effect, the, that tooth that they've got is the tooth they've got for the rest of their life, not all the tooth is exposed on the surface. And we've got tooth underneath the surface, which will eventually become tooth in the mouth that we can see as the horse wears its teeth. So when we're looking at this example of a skull, you can see in a young horse, we've got really, really big teeth. They um, um, basically almost um, filling up the entire skull and the mandible. Um, and this is the tooth that's got to last the horse's life. So when we're looking at the teeth, um, all we can see in the mouth is the clinical crown. So that's the bit that's exposed beyond the gum that we can actually see. Then we've got our gum line. And then underneath the gum, what we've got is what we call the reserve crown. So that is the crown that is one day going to become the clinical crown. And that gives us an advantage with horses when we think about diseases. And the roots of horses' teeth are actually only a very small part of the tooth. So we have this area of reserve crown in the centre of the tooth, which we as humans and small animals or dogs and cats don't have, but horses actually have this. So this does give us an advantage when we're thinking about treatments of various disease conditions. Now, obviously, as the teeth wear down, um, they've got to have another tooth to wear down opposite them. And effectively, therefore, they've got to have an antagonist. So for every upper tooth, you have to have a lower tooth so that they wear down evenly. And obviously, as they wear down throughout their life, the teeth shorten and you have a vast difference between young horse anatomy and old horse anatomy. Not only do we get a decrease in the length of the reserve crown, but as you can see in the picture of the old horse, we actually also have longer roots forming. Um, and there's always this misconception that kind of an old horse 
or so forth. It's a shorter crown. It should be easier to extract, but very often they've got these long roots, which can be a lot more tricky and are more likely to snap and break and could potentially cause issues. Um, so there's all these factors that we have to consider as horses age. And there's an example, actually, of the same tooth from two different horses of two different ages, but that's, you know, how a tooth would look. The tooth on the left, obviously, the long tooth would be a tooth in a young horse, whereas as opposed to a tooth on the right would probably be a, to a horse well into its 20s. But that's actually the same tooth from the same position in the mouth. The other thing that we have to remember, this is the, um, our famous donkey skull, which very clearly shows how large those teeth can be. And what a lot of people don't realize, yeah, <laughs> the picture on the left is not a donkey, but the skull <laughs> on the right is, yeah. But it demonstrates to us really that, um, you know, when those teeth are developing, um, they're actually um, they're extending and there's a lot of development that happens just before the tooth actually erupts. So that means just before it becomes visible in the mouth. And at that stage, the apex where the roots are going to be developed it's actually got very little bone between them. And we've actually got examples of skulls. You can see in this, this little pony, you can actually see they look a bit like chipmunks. They've got a little bit of facial swelling. And that's actually normal eruption bumps. Um, everybody's always very used to seeing eruption bumps on the mandible, on the lower jaw, but actually we do get eruption bumps on the upper teeth. But we've got examples of skulls where there's actually almost no bone overlying those developing and um, early erupting teeth. So. They can be very, very large structures and potentially can give us issues later on um, if they um, with infections and things. So also the other important thing to remember when we're looking at the dental anatomy is that they are anisognathic. So that means the upper jaw is wider than the lower jaw. Now, this has some easy kind of implications. Obviously, when horses are chewing, you can see the position of the teeth that obviously um, they get normal um, sharp points on the outside of the upper teeth and the inside of the lower teeth. And this is the horse's mouth when the horse's teeth, which is also kind of what we call the neutral position. So at the point where your incisors are in contact, your cheek teeth do not actually even touch or they just barely touch, but they're not really in, in complete contact. And there's often this misconception that, oh, if horses have got overly long incisors or something that they won't be able to chew and people should be balancing those incisors so that it, the horses can chew a bit better. But actually, if we look at how horses chew, actually the incisors have um, a very limited effect on affecting how the horses chew. So a horse moves a mandible, to the mandible moves um, open, or the a horse opens its jaw, the mandible then moves to the side, and at that point then um, the horse closes its jaw with the mandible um, out to one side, and at that point the cheek teeth make contact, and that is at the point that the horse will be grinding. So at any one time, a horse will only be chewing on one side of its mouth. Um, you know, in, in a normal horse, they should spend approximately 50% 50, 50 of their time chewing on left and right, um, but, it, you know, when you watch a horse, if you can, if you watch a horse for several minutes, they'll often be chewing on one side at a time. And eventually, if you watch them, they'll change over onto the other side. We still don't really know enough about how long horses will keep on chewing on one side. But if a horse is persistently and consistently only chewing on one side, it could indicate that there's a problem. Together, right? that that... Oh, yeah, and at the point that they come into contact, the incisors aren't together. Um, so this is actually an example of a closed mouth oroscope. So that's where we've um, um, the horse's mouth is actually closed and we've put our camera in down the side of the cheek. So we're looking from the kind of cheek side onto the teeth and you can see um, the mandible um, in the neutral position where the teeth are apart. And then when you move the mandible across, the cheek teeth actually come into contact and touch each other. So when, like I said, when the horse is in a neutral position, the cheek teeth are not in contact. And it's only during that chewing phase that the cheek teeth come into contact. And here's an example of a horse. And when you're watching, so this is something everybody can do in the stable every day. When you're watching your horse, can you see which side that horse is moving its mandible? It's quite easy to see the horse is moving its mandible to the right. Um, and if you watch a horse long enough, you should see at some point that the horse changes over to the to the to the left side. But this is quite normal for a horse. So um, like I said, we actually it's one of those things that would be quite good for owners, a good exercise. Just watch your horse, watch how your horse is eating. Make sure that you observe your horse at some stage to have eaten on both sides of its mouth. Um, the other thing that horses have is they have transverse ridges. We've also got cusp, cusps on our teeth. 
um, horses have transverse ridges, so this helps to um, increase the surface area of the teeth, but it also means that the kind of teeth semi-interlock with each other but while they're chewing, um, but that creates more, more surface area. It also helps to kind of make a more kind of cutting action rather than just a grinding action. And you do have a little bit of rostrocaudal or front to back movement as the horse is chewing. So just to demonstrate really how um, the transverse ridges increase the surface area, this is a very simple example of um, folding up a piece of paper. We have the same length of paper. So if horse's teeth were flat, they'd have a lot less surface area to chew on. Because if you think about the amount of food that horses have to eat, and they spend about 16 hours a day actually chewing, and the coarse food that they have to grind down, they need as much surface area as possible. Um, and this is not a new thing. This has been around for a long, long time. Um, if we go back to looking at examples of dinosaurs, you can see very much um, that interlocking and ridges helps to increase the surface area. Otherwise, we'd all be walking around with very, very long jaws to accommodate for a very, very long teeth. Um, and this is an example of a very unfortunate case where you can see where the horse's teeth has been completely smoothed off and completely rasped. And that's not the aim of when we're treating teeth and when we're rasping teeth. We don't want to smooth the teeth off. You want to um, correct it. You want to rebalance the mouth. You want to take away some sharp edges. And in this kind of scenario, there's also a risk that potentially the horse has had some sensitive dentine exposed. So that kind of scenario, we don't want to take away the horse's normal anatomy when we are rasping the horse's teeth. So Chris had already shown to us that when um, that we have big nerves in the head and the big nerves communicate with the pulp. Um, so the pulp tissue is actually a very active tissue. It contains lots of important cells, blood vessels, nerves, lymph, lymphatic vessels, um, contain some um, white blood cells, which are really important for the immune system, can even contain some mesenchymal cell, can help with the repair of the pulp tissue. And of course, the, the pulp means the tooth is alive and throughout the life of the horse, it will be um, making um, roots. Um, and this is just an example of um, a pulp that was removed from a very, very young horse. You can see how large they are. Um, as horses age, the pulp ones will become smaller and that same thing happens to us. But the important thing that we have to remember about horses is because they keep wearing the teeth on the surface, they must have some kind of mechanism whereby they stop those pulp ones from becoming exposed on the surface. And this has always been the million dollar question that for many, many years, people, there's been lots of debate about how much tooth can you actually rasp from a horse's surface before you expose the um, the, the pulp horns or open up the pulp horns. So as horses um, chew and they wear down the surface of the teeth, the pulp horns are constantly laying down secondary dentine, particularly on the surface of the teeth so that as the teeth wear down, the pulp horns don't become exposed. Um, and in this study at Edinburgh, um, which was done quite a few years ago now, was one of the first studies that really we wanted to demonstrate how much secondary dentine there is, how safe can it be to rasp horses' teeth. And although they're able to show that actually on average horses have 10 millimetres on the surface before you will open up the pulp horn, they were in some cases as little as two millimetres and in some cases as much um, as almost nearly three and a half centimetres. But the other thing to consider is you don't just want to know at what point you've actually opened up the pulp horn because what, at what, that point you've already got a potentially infected tooth and you've caused some severe pain to the horse. There will also be an element of some sensitive dentine on the surface. So it's not just about getting to the point where you've opened up the pulp horn. So um, that is, a, you know, still there's still no magic crystal ball that we can look at to see that tooth. We can um, rasp this, this much or that much. But we know that on average you should be safe with two to three millimeters. But you should be observing how you're rasping to make sure that you're definitely not getting um, potential exposure of the um, pulp horns. Um, I'm going to hand you back over to Chris. He's going to do some dental and oral abnormalities. OK, thank you, Nicole. So we're just going to go through some of the more common diseases that we see of the oral cavity in the teeth. And the first one, really, we should always start when we're examining the mouth. We always start by looking at the soft tissues and we'll see quite a few bitting injuries. Now, I'm not going to spend too long talking about bitting injuries. We've done lots of other talks on those, but it is really important to look because once again, you know, even, even quite severe bitting injuries can go unnoticed. So we do have to look for these. It's really important for riders and jockeys and owners to just inspect the commissures of the lips, the corners of the mouth. You can even feel the bars of the mouth of your fingers to make sure there's not sores and ulcers and things. So we do see a lot of these. And some people say, oh, well, you need to rasp the teeth more. 
well, there's an argument that you might need to stop pulling on the reins so much. So it's a balance. You know, we do need to make the horses comfortable, but we also need to have conversations with owners sometimes and riders to make sure that they are um, aware of, of what potential harm the bit can do. So that's bitting. I'm not going to talk any more about that. Um, the next thing, as we start talking about the teeth, we'll see some horses with less than the normal number of teeth, and we'll see some horses with more than the number of teeth. And this is a little donkey called Elvis from the donkey sanctuary, and the dental technicians at the donkey sanctuary noticed that he had very big bulges appearing around the front of the face. Now, as we know from what Nicole said, these can be normal, but this was followed up with a thorough oral examination and it was discovered that he's got two extra teeth or supernumerary teeth growing down through the nasal passages and pushing the normal teeth out to the side. And there's some nasty gaps with food collecting around here and it's exactly the same on both sides. So this is a real problem for the future because the food will continue to pack in here. These teeth will continue to be pushed out to the side and we'll show you later what we did about that. We often see these extra teeth growing or erupting at the back of the mouth and because they are extra teeth in number there's usually not another one opposite them that they can grind against so they will often overgrow and become very large indeed and if these are not spotted early when they first come through um, sometimes they can just be managed by simple rasping them Sometimes they need to be removed, but if they're not spotted early and they become very big, they can get really problematic. So Nicole's already mentioned this, that the, and that sort of leads us on nicely about the extra teeth. Every tooth has to have an equal and opposite number to grind against, and it has to be perfectly aligned. If not, that's when things go wrong, because the teeth will continue to erupt, whether they've got a tooth opposite them or not. And if the tooth is displaced or rotated or doesn't come through perfectly, just like we have now, I'm sure many of you listening will have had braces. If you haven't had braces, maybe your kids have had braces or you'll definitely know people who have had braces or everyone has Invisalign now. And that's to line all our teeth up and keep them sort of functioning properly against the opposite ones and sometimes just to look better. But for horses, they don't have an opportunity to have braces, certainly not at the moment. And if their teeth come through um, less than perfectly on top of each other, then we can see some real problems developing over time. And this is called a malocclusion. And these focal overgrowths or these malocclusions will often deteriorate pretty markedly as horses age. And as soon as we get any loss of teeth or broken teeth, we'll see the overgrowths developing, causing extra pressure in those areas and sometimes creating real problems. And this is a very common scenario that we would see from horses that don't have regular dentistry. We'll often see that there's a lot of differential wear and that there are a lot of these focal overgrowths developing, which will progressively get worse and worse and worse and cause more and more problems as horses age. And there's just a few examples here uh, of how this can go so badly wrong when there's missing teeth, fractured teeth, those, those big strong teeth that are not disease so these are the healthy teeth actually the problem is down below where there's missing teeth or gaps these will just keep on erupting and you can see how sharp this is these will start cutting into the gum forcing food down into the gum and causing all sorts of problems now the most simple form of wear abnormalities or focal overgrowth are known as sharp enamel points and these develop as nicole said on the outside of the upper cheek teeth and the inside of the lower cheek teeth and if they get too sharp or too big then they will cause ulcers of the cheeks. And we can address this by simply rasping these sharp points and reducing them. Again, we have to be very careful not to go too far and go into these pulp canals, but um, in general, a, a jolly good rasp um, by somebody who really knows what they're doing will, will resolve these more minor problems. Other times where abnormalities can appear if a horse is only eating on one side of its mouth for a very long period of time. And in this case, I was called to extract this tooth here on the left of the horse, the right as we look at it. And when I was there extracting that broken tooth, I asked the client, what's going on on this side? Why on earth have we got this strange change here? And the owner said, well, he's um, 17 years old now. Um, 
I've had him since a four year old and I, she was told by her dentist, dental technician at the time, that he has a deformity caused by him probably being in the womb and having a leg on his face or something and putting pressure on. It's caused a tilting and deformity of the palate and resulted in the teeth being at a funny angle. So every year for the last 14 years, this horse had the right side rasped to try and balance and correct it and the owner told me that every year it just got worse and worse and it's all to do with this deformity from a foal. I said that's utter rubbish, that's complete nonsense, this horse has just been eating on the left side, the right as we look at it, all the time and it's not been eating on this side at all. This is a condition known as sheer mouth which is nearly always due to dental pain and a horse just not wanting to eat on that side at all. So I had a look with the camera. You can't see it for looking from here. And this tooth on the right is the tooth that was the problem. It was the 410, which is the fifth one from the front. So right at the back. And you can see on the root here, we've got an open root. I've got a metal rod going right through the middle of the tooth. And we have food and pus coming out of the bottom of the tooth. And actually, I can tell you that what we also have at the root here at the bottom end of the tooth is enamel. Now, I won't go into this in too much detail, but during the life of a horse, root formation means that you should never have enamel at the root end of a tooth in a 17-year-old. That usually is lost and covered in cementum or changed to cementum by the time it's three or four years of age. So the only logical explanation for there being enamel and a big wide open root is that that tooth died when the horse was about three or four years old, which completely fits with the history that this problem has been present since it was four. It's now 17, so that dead, rotten, diseased tooth has been sat there for 12 to 13 years, which was a pretty sad state of affairs to discover. But it's all about people understanding what they're looking at and then referring cases on to people who are appropriately qualified to deal with them rather than making something up or saying what they learned on their weekend course or whatever it was that oh it's caused by this that or the other complete and utter rubbish and not at all scientific so the other kind of wear abnormalities that we see is in older horses and now we do have the root areas these teeth are starting to expire or wear out and we'll often see some that are missing and have been lost ones that are left might be loose and we've got the root area now coming onto the surface and it's often very smooth so we call that smooth mouth and this will cause some real differential wear between the top and the bottom depending on the state of expiry of the teeth so this is a big problem sometimes in geriatric horses another condition that we see disease that we see really commonly is diastema diastomata periodontal disease and this is where food gets trapped between abnormal spaces in the teeth and results in some really painful periodontal disease. This is very, very common condition. Sometimes it's caused by displaced or rotated teeth and the food, anywhere there's a little gap that shouldn't be there, food will start packing in there and it will cause really painful gum disease and sometimes so bad that the teeth become loose and become lost. This is a racehorse. This is a three-year-old racehorse in training and it's got nasty diastema, diastomata, gaps both sides of the mouth, and you can see the sharp food that's being fed has resulted in these incredibly painful deep ulcers in the tongue on both sides. What signs did this horse show of these problems? Well, the trainer told me that he was a bit headstrong on the gallops, and that sometimes when he was standing with the head over the door, he seemed to be producing a lot of saliva. No other signs, he seemed to be eating okay, um, seemed to be performing okay, although he was a little bit trying to run through everybody on the gallops, but we don't even know if that's to do with this. So another incredible case. We can treat these fairly effectively. This is a nice, simple treatment that we often do known as partial occlusal diastema widening. And you can see that we've just gone from the left to the right in one treatment where the food's packing and now the gums all healed and everything's fine. So the next disease that we see quite commonly is root disease. So those nerve or pulp channels that Nicole showed us, they can become diseased and become dead and they get infected and they will cause a root abscess, pretty much exactly the same as happens in humans. Root abscesses, tooth abscess in horses will often cause swellings of the face. When we take x-rays, we can see the characteristic signs around the tooth root. 
um, that tell us that, they're, that the tooth is infected. And most of the time, these teeth need extracting, otherwise the infection will just get worse and worse, and the swellings will get bigger, the bone might become infected. If the roots are in the sinus, the sinus will come infected of the top teeth, and so on and so forth, and things often will go from bad to worse if these are not treated. So let's have a look at Joey again, who was pulling these funny faces and had this sinus infection. And let's have a look in his mouth and see if I'm right that this could be caused by a dental problem. So this is the view you would get if you wash the mouth out and have a look in the mouth. Not very remarkable. Doesn't seem to be any of those overgrowths, doesn't seem to be any ulcers anywhere, doesn't seem to be any problem at all. There's no fractures of the teeth. For all intents and purposes, that looks like a completely normal mouth. So now we go in and look with a oral camera and we look really close up. This is looking about five millimetres from the surface of the tooth. And we can now see that there's a tiny little oval discoloration. That's food actually packing into a tiny hole. This hole is normal. So again, we need to know our anatomy. This little gap here is not normal. So we do a CT scan and we find that there's an infection in the root, there's gas in the root and inflammation around the root. And it is indeed a diseased tooth with a root abscess. So we do a flush of the sinus. So we make a little hole in the head and we put some sterile saline in there under pressure and we flush out all the pus. <laughs> nice pussy video for you. Um, so that relieves the pressure from the sinus and then we extract the tooth. And here's the tooth extracted. You can see just about the tiny little holes on the surface. Can't really see them very well because they're so tiny. But those little holes lead to infection and decay that's running through the whole tooth. And we can see that the pulp canals here dead, dead, dead. But actually, these two are still alive. So that is a diseased tooth. And if we don't treat the teeth or extract them, then those little holes become big holes like these as the tooth starts to decay and rot. And the next thing that happens is that the teeth can fracture. I'll just show you what happened with Stanley. This is our big fat cob with the two big swellings and the smelly pus coming out of the jaw. And he had two dead teeth, just like that. He's only a four year old. So these teeth um, have been dead for a few years, even at four. You can could see then that he's got holes in the surface, just like we showed. And now I'm looking with the camera down the side of the mouth. Now just look there. Did you see that? little area just at the side back there. So here it is. We'll just go back and have another look. And there's a bubble just appeared at the gum margin, at where the gum joins the tooth. Put a bit of pressure here. And what do we see? We see pus leaking out. Now, I'm not pushing from outside. I'm not doing anything. The horse is just resting its head on a headstand. Um, the swelling is hard and bony, but it's constantly dribbling pus and gas out of the hole. Now, Human dentists tell us that the reason that you get excruciating pain from a tooth abscess is a buildup of pressure that can't escape. And that pressure will be from gas and it will be from pus and inflammation. If there's a route for it to escape, so if it's burst, suddenly the pressure is relieved and the pain is not so severe at all. And actually, you could probably cope with it. So the fact that this pus is draining into the mouth doesn't mean that the situation is OK. It just means that the excruciatingly painful phase is gone and the poor horse is now just sitting there with two rotten dead teeth in the mouth, which can then go on and cause further problems. Doing You're doing this one. So now I'm going to pass back to Nicole. Back to me. So I'm going to do a couple of things of anatomy before I hand over back to Chris again. So one of the other um, common... Jesus. Yeah, common, sorry, diseases. One of the other common diseases that we see in horses is infundibular caries, which is decay. So infundibular or enamel cups is a structure that we see in hypsodon teeth. And in horses, they are, we've got two present in each of the upper teeth. This is obviously, this is an example of one with disease. So those two structures that you see in the center of the tooth is effectively a dead or blind ending enamel cup that should be lined by enamel and filled with a dental tissue called cementum, which should be yellow. Um, and it doesn't communicate with the pole point. So it's not part of the live tissue anymore. But what we have in horses is that we very often get this defect in the, the cementum development. Um, and here you can see an example of a more, you know, almost normal tooth that um, has good cementum towards the crown surface or occlusally, as we say, um, but um, it tends to have a defect 
um, lower down. So what happens in some cases is that this defect is really large and you can get food entering and it causes a type of decay, which um, is what we call infundibular caries. Now, these can be significant because they can progress, they can weaken the tooth and the tooth can end up splitting in two. And we commonly see this. In fact, I've just this week seen two horses that I've had to extract teeth out, which are fractured just for this kind of reason. Um, so infundibular caries is very much a significant disease. Um, and then, of course, we can get fractures of other types. So Chris has already mentioned, if you've got pulp disease or chronic pulp disease, you get that decay happening. And then, of course, the tooth fractures. And this horse that you can see here was cleaning out the food. This was actually a horse, a show jumper that presented a completely routine dental examination. Nobody had any idea that there was something wrong with it. Found this fracture too. And then on questioning the owner, it turns out that the horse has recently started kind of pulling to the right when it's approaching a jump. And um, that was all. <laughs> that was yes, all. and that was all. So it didn't have any other problems. So they, it, they literally presented for routine, had no inkling that there was anything to see. Then, of course, you know, we kind of, the cheek teeth are very important to be able to chew and very much important for survival. Um, but the incisor teeth, um, we mustn't forget about them. They can still have painful conditions. Very common in younger horses that you can get fractures, like this picture here on the right, and sometimes even in older horses. Amazing how they can actually sometimes just fracture one tooth in a row of teeth and not fracture any others. But this is painful. You know, this has got an open pulp, um, and that will be a painful condition. But very often when the horses present to us, this has been present for a while and the owners haven't even noticed because the horse hasn't shown any clinical signs. This is another example. This is kind of, for some reason, this tooth developed an infection and died. And suddenly, um, on a routine examination, we might notice this little draining tract. And when you look on the surface of the tooth, there's a black spot indicating that there's a hole. So this was effectively an incisor that has died previously. I'm just going to talk a little bit and I'll go over just really briefly about EOTRH because people always ask us about that. And that was the example of the case that Chris showed earlier on of the horse with the really, really terrible incisors. And this was a disease that was also recognized, started being recognized about 20 years ago. And the clinical signs are very often subtle and not often noticed by horses, by owners, but more common in older horses. And they present with gum disease, deep-seated gum disease, what we call periodontitis. You can sometimes see recession of the gums. Um, you can suddenly see plaque, plaque and calculus building up on these teeth and sometimes thickening of the gums overlying them. And the frustration with this disease, it's really a diagnosis by radiograph, by taking x-rays. Without x-rays, we wouldn't know. And the disease, the basis of the disease is really tooth resorption, which is a condition which we actually see in cats and humans as well. But with the progressive resorption, it obviously causes disease. You get infection in the teeth. And in some cases in horses, we can get this hypersemintosis. So this is where the roots actually become thickened. Um, but even these kind of cases, they've associated with really deep-seated gum disease or periodontal disease, as we call it, and really, really, really painful. Um, and the frustration is the disease can present very difficult um, differently. So even and in this case here on the left, where the gums don't look so bad, you might end up radiographing it and find actually there's a, there's a severe disease underneath the surface. Whereas these kind of cases, it's pretty obvious that the horse has got severe disease and it's a lot easier for owners to un appreciate and understand that these kind of cases require complete extraction. And Chris has already shown the example of actually how well these horses do without these teeth. And these teeth aren't essential for survival because they can adapt and use their, their gums and effectively they use their tongues and their lips a lot. Um, Chris is going to talk about the dental team before yeah. I take you back again. So there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of sort of professionals and some non-professionals actually in the dental um, world, in the dental industry. And for hundreds of years, teeth have been rasped. Um, certainly when I started out as a vet, the farrier, used to rasp some teeth in the area using his foot rasp, um, have a little go with that. And there's plenty of people who have sort of been on a weekend course and now call themselves an equine dentist. Um, and there's people that are qualified to rasp teeth, there's dental technicians and there's vets. And so, so just going to talk about the whole team and how everything sort of fits together. So you'll hear that this term equine dentist a lot. So I've got here a sort of a, a triangle or a pyramid of dental care and dental professionals. And, and sort of at the bottom, we've got the equine dentist as they're known. And that can literally be any Tom, Dick or Harry can call themselves an equine dentist. And any of you people that are lovely people, probably very knowledgeable about horses, any of you could go tomorrow, buy yourself some tooth rasps, print yourself some very nice looking business cards, walk onto a yard and say, 
hello, my name's Jane. I'm a dentist, equine dentist, and I've come to ask for your teeth. And you may have been on a weekend course or a week long course in America or something. And if you say, oh, I've been to America and done a course, then everyone's going to think you're amazing. But you will not be properly trained or licensed or regulated by anybody if you do anything wrong. So there will be no recourse to what's going on. And these, I would say, are the people to avoid at all costs. Um, it's a sad thing that the dentist term is used all the time because it does suggest a very high level of qualifi qualification because, of course, human dentists are doctors with specialist training in dentistry. It's a five-year university degree with quite challenging entry requirements. So to be a human dentist is, is, a, is a sort of a really high level of qualification, but anyone can call themselves an equine dentist so that creates problems but then we have dental technicians and dental technician is completely different really they're not vets um, but they're very well trained and they're very highly skilled they're kind of like the farriers of, dent of the dentistry world if you like so they um, have done a lot of training they've done an examination they're regulated by their association and in the UK we have two groups which we would recommend that have become recognized by the government, by DEFRA originally, and that's the BADT, that's the British Association of Equine Dental Technicians, and then there's the Worldwide Association of Equine Dental Technicians. And actually they have registers online, so if you have um, somebody other than your vet coming to rasp the teeth or do re re remedial treatments or uh, regular treatments, um, then you should look at that register and make sure that they are actually registered. And actually one simple way is that they will they will refer to themselves as dental technicians. That's what EDT stands for. And it's the British Association of Equine Dental Technicians, not dentists. So that's quite an important difference. And then we have uh, veterinary surgeons above this line and veterinary surgeons are then qualified to really do anything um, to any animal. It doesn't mean you're any good, but when you graduate, you are legally entitled and licensed with your veterinary degree to do anything um, to animals. And that does include rasping teeth. Uh, but the problem is you've got some equine vets have done a lot of training and some vets that haven't done so much training. So that can be a little bit difficult to work out. So it's really good to have a good conversation with your vet. Most vets will be very honest and, and, and upfront about what they've done and what their appropriate qualifications are. If they're really interested in dentistry, they can sit another exam and do some extra training and then they can become advanced practitioners. Um, which is a Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons qualification. Um, and that demonstrates that they've got a much higher level of interest in training. Um, and then at the top of the period, you've got the veterinary specialist. And the specialist term is something that is a regulated and protected title um, from the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons that infers the highest level of qualification. It's a five year minimum um, residency program. So sort of very concentrated training period. And um, you have to be 10 years graduated as a vet before you can even start that process. So that's a pretty difficult and challenging thing to achieve. It takes a long time. And those of us that have it, me, Nicole, Richard, we're very proud of that and not surprisingly very protective. So when we hear that the dentist came who's a specialist in teeth, you can see it doesn't <laughs> create the best feeling. So it's very important to understand where everybody sits. And I wouldn't say anybody's any more special than anybody else not wanting to use the word specialist but there's this 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 should be a whole team we should drop the people on the bottom out of the loop completely and what we find is that the qualified dental technicians will often refer to their local vet for things that they can't do um, or not legally entitled to do and then they would in turn refer on to advanced practitioners or to specialists at the top so i'm not going to go too much longer about this but i think the important thing to remember is that um, dentistry is a difficult and challenging thing to do and it does require a lot of skill to do it properly and I'm just going to show you this video from how dentistry was done back in 1914. This is an incredible video um, which shows um, dentistry being done in Germany and you can see the people that are doing it sort of look the part they've got white coats on um, making them look sort of professional they're using um, a sort of a screw type gag that goes in uh, he's trying to have a look, but he hasn't got a headlight, so you can't really see. The horse is being restrained by an ear twitch. Someone else is probably holding the tongue. The horse is obviously not enjoying the procedure. There's four or five people hanging on to it to try and restrain it. Um, and it's a pretty sad state of affairs. Now, if that horse has any problems, they're not going to be properly treated in this way. Nobody can really see what's going on. 
and nobody's making any proper diagnosis and the horse is becoming pretty stressed by the whole thing. So that is how dentistry was done for many, many years. Obviously, some people were more skilled than others, but there was always a bit of a problem with restraint. Uh, but the more training that dental technicians have, the better they become at doing their work. But this kind of lay dentistry by by so-called dentists, this, this is something that you shouldn't have done. If someone wants to rasp your horse's teeth by the side of the road, you want to run a mile. Veterinary surgeons, as we said, can do anything, sedation, examination, um, they can do extractions, x-rays, um, any treatment, sinus surgeries, but it's very important to understand that those extractions and things, they require nerve blocks and sedation. They can't be done by people that are not vets, even under direct supervision. But as I said, a lot of the dental technicians are very, very skilled and we don't want in any way to suggest that you shouldn't use dental technicians, but you do want to check their qualifications. Right, I'm just going to go through a little bit about the dental visit. And this is really just to kind of give horse owners a, an idea of, you know, what, what we think um, they should be expecting at the dental visit when when your dental practitioner comes to do your horse's teeth. So obviously the first thing, you know, they should be asking questions about how your horse is. Is your horse eating OK? Have you noticed any problems? As we've already reiterated very seldom we do but sometimes there might be minor issues that you might have concern about that could pinpoint or help kind of direct now um as vets we uh, a lot of our vets we like to sedate we um, have a policy of of sedation so obviously if you do have a vet treating it and they are sedating the horse then um that will really help the horse to be calm um, um obviously we're not saying that every horse has to be sedated but we would recommend a sedated exam at least every few years because we think that there's sometimes some things that might be missed and a non-sedated exam. Now, the sedation, people are often worried about it. It's a very safe drug. It gets used every day. We use it every day. Um, and it just helps the horse to relax. It means the whole procedure is very, very stress-free um, and it's very safe and it's, and it's quite short acting. When we're doing the oral exam, then it's really important. We've really discussed really about knowing the anatomy, knowing the pathology, knowing um, little tricks and things. So, for example, in the picture above, you could see that there was a very pronounced single overgrowth. Why would there be a single overgrowth in that area? Well, if you look in the mirror, you can actually see that there's some food packing. And then the picture below um, shows after the tooth's been rasped, and you can actually see the horse had a nasty diastema. So this horse was able to chew in a way that it avoided eating in that area, and that's resulted in that um, sharp enamel point, um, a, a very localized sharp enamel point over that area. Whether your horse is sedated or not, it's very important that the horse's head is kind of at a level where you're looking straight into the horse's mouth. Um, you have a headstand, but we use a headstand, and which we find helps to keep the horse's head up so we can actually look straight into the mouth. Have a bright light, have an array of diagnostic instruments, picks and probes so that you can examine things, um, but pick out any food that's packing anyway so you can see if there's any um, significant disease underneath it. Um, and then, of course, we have to have the dental mirror, otherwise you can't see. So this is an example when you're standing in, a ho um, standing in front of the horse, you've washed out the mouth, you should be able to have a really good view of all the teeth. But as you can see um, from this picture, if we're looking just from the front of the mouth as you look further back, you're not going to be able to see all the surfaces of the of the um, of the upper teeth as you go further back, and you can't actually appreciate any of the surfaces of the lower teeth, the mandibular teeth. So that's why it's important that you have a mirror. And this is an example of the mirror exam. You can clearly see you can see there's a bit of food packing. You can't really see where that food's packing, but when you look now with the mirror, you can actually see that food packing is quite significant. It really is a diastema. The, now you can see you can actually see the horses obviously previously had some kind of fillings which you couldn't appreciate by just looking from the front of the mouth so that's why the mirror exam is really really important um of course if you um having further advanced treatment or we offer services as well and i think more and more vets and dental technicians are now have have oroscopes or video cameras with them in their cars and this is really 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 revolutionized for us being able to examine horses, being able to diagnose things, and of course, being able to provide advanced treatments. Because without a camera, you really can't be doing things like fillings and root canals and even very some of the tricky extractions. You really, really need 
that kind of camera. Um, and I would say, you know, we would be completely blind without our cameras and wouldn't be able to provide half the treatments we do. So this has really revolutionized equine dentistry and um, allowing us to provide a, a really high level of dental care to these horses. So when we're rasping the horse's teeth, um, the horse should be nice and relaxed. Here you can see Mickey, one of our vets rasping the horse. You can see the horse has had some light sedation. The horse is standing still. You can see the horse's ears and eyes are moving, but the horse isn't stressed at all. Um, and it's all done really quickly. You'll also see as Nikki's busy rasping, her light shining in. She can see exactly where she's rasping. She can rasp the teeth. She's not rasping them blindly. She can um, aim specifically for um, very much little individual overgrowths and things. Um, and also, of course, um, after she's rasped or during the rasping, she'll also stop and have a feel and make sure that all the um, surfaces where there were sharp enamel points are not causing impingements on the cheeks and making sure that the rasping's all been done correctly. You can see the friend's waiting for his turn next. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to show you an example of, um, you know, and this is unfortunately what happens every day. This is an example of a horse, a client that came to us um, and she had brought her young horse to us um, and he has his teeth rasped annually by her vet under sedation in this circumstance. But the owner had noticed that recently he started tilting his head when he's riding and he's pulling where he faces when he's eating, sometimes kind of shaking his head a little bit and showing, started showing some mild head shaking when ridden. Now, she brings her older horse to us every six months because her older horse has had, had some dental issues. And even though her vet had told her the horse's teeth are fine and she knows that she has the teeth rasped religiously every 12 months, she kind of thought that when the horse has a teeth rasped by her vet, even though the vet sedates so the horse's head's on the ground, because when horses are sedated, their heads are quite heavy and they're down on the ground. And she thought, well, she's actually never seen the vet look into a horse's mouth. And she's seen how we've done her old horse. And she thought, even though her, the horse's teeth are done, she needs to bring the horse to us because she's convinced there's something wrong with the teeth. And when I opened up the mouth, this is kind of the scenario that we saw. And I think you can clearly see straight away, even to somebody who's never looked in a horse's mouth, can clearly see that we've got some really, really, really large overgrowth of the front teeth that haven't been addressed. Um, you can see some what we would call exaggerated transverse ridges, so um, ridges that are overly large with some sharp points. You can see there's some overgrowth here in the middle of the tooth, and you can really see actually um, the ulceration that the horse had on the side of the mouth. You can really see that ramp there. So I'm going to show you the horoscope video. Um, there is a little bit of food packing in here, but you can appreciate um, that we've got that overgrowth that we saw in the front. You can see there's actually a little bit of a chip fracture, sharp points. Can you see the changes in the cheeks with some ulceration um, causing some discomfort to the horse? So we, we know we've just got plain things like overgrowth, sharp points, and um, really, really, really was nasty sharp points. And of course, the owner was quite upset um, seeing how bad the horse is. But then when we looked at the lower teeth, once again, really bad ridges and of course, diastomums. So food packing, you can really see these razor sharp um, edges here, really cutting into the tongue. And when we go further back in the mouth or, or the other side, um, once again, same thing, and a very, very large overgrowth on the back of the mouth. So even though this horse had had his teeth done, um, fortunately, this owner had seen how horse's teeth can be done and um, realized something was amiss. And without looking and without being able to do an examination where the horse's head is up on a headstand where you're looking inside, those things are going to be missed, even with the best intentions um, when they're, when they're um, sedated or having a, a proper exam. I'm going to hand you back to Chris for some more advanced treatments. So Nicole mentioned there that the horse had some diastomas and we've talked about these. These are very common. You can see a couple of examples here. One on the left that we would call a valve diastema where the food can sort of get into a space between the teeth, but it can't get out uh, because it's wider at the bottom than at the top. And on the right, we've got a displaced tooth, slightly rotated tooth, and that's opened up a space and allowed food to get in. And really, because the food that horses eat is so fibrous and so thick and stalky, once it gets trapped in there, it's not coming out. And I'll just show a quick example here of one that um, I did an extraction on. This had been having flushing and treating for a little while, or for I think about a year, and hadn't got any better. So in this case, we did decide that the tooth should be extracted. And on extraction um, here, you'll see that after the tooth comes out, you'll just see how deep the food was packed down the side um, of the back of the tooth. It goes all the way down the socket, sort of a thatch of food, all the way down to the bottom. So when we're treating these diseases, 
we need to get all of that food out. But that didn't happen overnight. That food has been packing in there and to progress that far down into the dental socket that would have taken months or probably years. And in the early stages, these things are not so painful. So the horses will cope, but it's just when things get really bad that they start to show problems. So periodontal disease, um, we do a lot of dental extractions. This is for a root infection. Um, and you'll see we're using a sort of a system of sort of leverage to apply pressure downwards into the mouth for this tooth. And these horses will be sedated. They will be standing up in the stocks. They'll have nerve blocks and they'll have periodontal disease. <laughs> Sorry. And it takes usually on average about 45 minutes. So that's something else that's important to know that the the the, the sort of efficiency that people that do a lot of these procedures have these days has changed completely. Um, 20 years ago, it wouldn't be uncommon to spend a couple of days or, or so having a go at extracting these teeth. But really today it should all be done in one sitting and it should definitely not take a day or two days or a week or something silly like that. We also have some really lovely, elegant, modern techniques and one that was invented by good friends of ours in Germany. Manfred Stoll and Frank Schellenberg was a technique called the MTE or the minimally invasive transbuckle surgical technique for extracting broken teeth. So years ago, this used to be done under full anaesthetic with the horse lying down and they drill a big hole into its head and smash the tooth out backwards. And a lot of those would get complications and problems. So now we do things a bit differently. If we have a tooth that we can't grip the crown of, so it's broken and the big old root and big reserve crown is left under the gum, but we can't grip it with anything, what we do is we do a kind of keyhole surgery, place a little trocar or metal sleeve in the cheek. This is all with anaesthetic and local anaesthetic and sedation. And then we drill a little hole into the tooth very accurately using x-rays for guidance. Once we've got a hole in there, we can then create a threaded tap or threaded hole in the tooth. Then we can screw in a little bolt into the tooth and then we can start to very gently tap it downwards and bring the tooth out. You can see this pony there was a discharging tracked with pus coming out in the face from the infected tooth. So that brings us back to Elvis. Now you remember Elvis had these two supernumerary extra teeth growing out through the nose. And in the old days, they would have drilled a couple of holes up here and smashed these teeth out through the nasal passages. That's really the only other way of getting those out. Um, so we did this new keyhole technique and you'll see then here's a reminder of what the teeth look like. Not really any way of getting forceps onto these very easily. So we decided to go for this keyhole technique. And so we placed the trocar in the sleeve and you'll see that there's a real acute angle of those teeth actually growing back at a funny angle. And I'm showing this image to warn you that the next video is a little bit graphic and there's a bit of blood. So look away now if you don't want to see. But so now what you can see is that we've drilled the hole into the tooth. We've secured the metal rod into the tooth that's passing out through the cheek and then uh, my assistant is tapping in a downwards direction to bring the tooth out. Uh, some of you are going to be very disappointed then weren't you that it didn't happen. So here it comes. Recording. So I'm just checking that Holly's recording my nurse and then we start tapping the tooth from the outside in a downwards direction. So this is all done through this little keyhole incision and you'll see here comes the tooth little bit more, little bit more tapping and a little bit of blood is released, which is pretty normal, especially when the tooth is in this location. And there it is. It's all out with just a little keyhole incision. So that's a really nice example. These healed up perfectly normally. And then those other teeth can then they will drift back into their normal position once that's been uh, performed. So we're sort of coming towards the close of this. We've got some case examples to show you now, and then we'll do half hour of questions. But the, the really overriding message really with all of this, and you saw this image of the horse on the left earlier on, and I said it has dental disease and it looks a bit thin and maybe a bit old and dropping the food out of its mouth. Well, the only way or the best way to treat this horse would be to go back in time 10 or 15 years, do a proper examination, identify some early problems that are starting to develop, have a discussion with the owner who, who really is completely unaware that there's anything wrong. And by addressing these problems here and now, there will not be a problem 10 or 15 years later. And the horse by this age will be fit 
and well and in really good body condition and not looking like it does there. So that is really the take home message. So let's just quickly go through a few case examples. Now, this is the one that I mentioned right at the beginning that we had on our Facebook story today. Don't let, let, let this be your horse. Now, I think somebody wrote in the comments and said, oh, this horse will be drooling. It will be dropping food out of the mouth. It will probably have infection in the nose. Didn't have any of that. This horse is not showing any clinical signs at all. It was just examined by um, a vet, actually, and it was referred on for treatment. And there's the video just looking. You can see, as Nicole discussed, we've got these big overgrowths here signifying there's a problem below. So we'll, oh, actually, just out of interest, when I examined it, we did the incisor examination and found that it also has three dead incisor teeth. So that was something else. We did root canals on these teeth. But if we now look at the oral examination, the first thing we have are infundibular caries cavities of the upper six teeth that may well be a problem in the future. And as we go on examining, so we're on the horse's top right arcade at the moment, this one up here, and we find at the back that we can't see, there's a nasty gap and a sharp enamel point with a diastema or a food impaction. Then we come and look on the other side at the top on the left, another infundibular caries there. And as we go further back, we've got another big overgrowth. There it is there, that's the overgrowth. And then as we go further back, we've got another sharp point and another beginning of a diastema forming here. Now we're gonna rotate the camera around and have a look at the bottom row. And we're gonna see why we've got these nasty gaps. And we're looking now at the bottom left row that we can't really see from this image here. And we see there's a rotten, dead, long-standing disease tooth which is just not really erupting properly and just sat there and it's all black and discolored it's got openings into the pulp chambers here it's got some other types of dentine there and on the other side we find we've got actually another deformed and dysplastic tooth so we had quite a lot of things going on with this case so we take an x-ray and we find that this tooth has been diseased for so long that actually most of the root structure has been reabsorbed by the body the bone has reacted around it, become very thickened, and actually in the long run, this tooth has become so small, it was just ended up wedged with nasty sharp points sticking down into the gum, and it was actually a relatively straightforward extraction. So once again, this poor pony has been living with this rotten, dead black tooth for many, many, many years, and it's been coping. Doesn't mean it's been not in pain, but it has been somehow coping. Let's look at another one. So this was one I saw today. It's always nice to put in an example that we've seen recently. This is an 18 year old pony gelding. Now I've actually seen it twice. Today was the follow up. This pony has been in very poor bodily condition for many years and it's had a lot of investigations. And I think that actually is one horse that did have weight loss from dental disease. It's also been traditionally a very aggressive pony, biting other people, biting other horses. And that's one of the things the owner said when it came in. Be careful when you go near him because he's a bit of a grumpy little chap. He will bite you if you if you sort of get too close. He's had regular dentistry by the local vet. And this is what we see when we examine the mouth. A couple of little videos. Got We've got a displacement of a tooth here. And just here you can see another something looks like the tooth is sticking out into the cheek. So when we look with our camera, sure enough, we find that that tooth was very badly displaced. We've got a huge gap here. Got a really nasty ulcer on the cheek, a big open ulcer of the cheek. That's because there's a big twig stuck between that nasty gap. So there's a big diastema with a twig in there causing ulceration and pain in the cheek. And then as we go further back, let's just show the bottom now on the left. We've got another diastema here. Then we've got a sort of a normal tooth. Um, and then we've got, you'll see the next tooth is displaced and sticking out into the cheek. Just looking at the nasty pus that's there. There's another diastema there. This tooth is a bit displaced towards the tongue. And then we've got this one that's stuck out into the cheek with a really nasty diastema there. Now, we don't really know how long this has been going on, but I saw him today and we had another look in the mouth and I put a little bridge in here and you can see this bridge, so sort of bridging the gap. It's allowed the gum to completely heal. There's no food packing and there's not really any food packing anywhere. We've done some some nice remedial rasping of the teeth and it doesn't have any gaps anymore. That's a bit discolored because it's opposing the tooth that I've extracted. The teeth have been 
sort of nicely balanced and rasped. And when we look at the bottom row, we see that the diastomas are much, much better. The gum looks very much more healthy. There's no sort of inflammation or bleeding at the gum level now. You can see some little grooves where we've done a little technique known as partial widening. The gums look beautiful. And the one where we extracted that displaced tooth is doing fine. And the reason that I show this is because the owner came in today, literally just this afternoon, and she was absolutely delighted because from the minute he came around from the sedation and went home without that tooth stuck in the cheek, he's never bitten anybody in the last month. And he's a completely different pony. Stopped biting everybody, brighter and happy. You can probably still, he's still not in the best body condition, but even in a month, we think he's put on weight and is looking better. So quite a remarkable turnaround, really just from some what was actually relatively straightforward treatment. I think Nicole's got a nice case for us now. Yeah, so this is a this was a case of a nine-year-old Clydesdale horse and she was rescued um, and she had an unknown history. And as you can see from her, she's in pretty poor condition. And, you know, nine-year-old horse, um, she's quite young, so she should definitely not be looking like this, but she looks like an old horse, but she wasn't that old. And unfortunately... Um, I think what happened with her, somehow she'd ended up in some ownership, which she'd never had her teeth done. Um, and as you can see from this example, or, you know, this is this is kind of what what faced me when I opened her mouth. Um, and these large breed horses um, can be pre predisposed to having issues. Um, but this is, you know, what happens when teeth aren't treated, when teeth aren't rasped regularly. Things that could have been caught on earlier has now got so far that sometimes we've kind of gone beyond it. So. We've got really large overgrowth. You can straight away see there's loads of food packing everywhere. There's another big overgrowth in the back. And if you look really far at the back there, you can see that there's, an, there's a, a nasty sharp overgrowth of the last tooth. And look at that, that ulceration that she has right, right in the back of the mouth. So this poor horse, um, this was one, kind of a rare example of one of those cases where dental disease really has caused weight loss. Um, she probably hasn't had the best of care and feeding and things, but you know she should have had access to grass and hay and she just wasn't able to actually eat it. Um, you know, I've done a little bit of a close-up. You can actually see there were some displaced teeth. That's actually food packing all the way down deep into the gums. And like I said, that kind of scenario, that is really, really painful for her. So I've got an horoscope video, um, and we can see, I think this one's a little bit dark, but you can clearly see she's got overgrowth, um, and you get got food packing and things. Um, and, I mean, this was a horse that was obviously in a lot of trouble. I've got an example as well. Yeah, that's at the top, that kind of ulceration. And so that's kind of ulceration because the tooth on the bottom had got so long and overgrown, so it was effectively eroding in the back of the mouth. Now we get on the side where you can see the really, really nasty. And these these bits with a food pack really, really stinks. You know, that proper decaying food. Well, yeah, yeah, really, really deep ulcer there on the side of the cheek. Um, so this poor horse was in a lot of pain and in a lot of hurt. And I always say to people, you know, I think horse's favourite thing is to eat. And if e eating um, is associated with pain, you know, every time this poor horse tries to eat, it's painful or even more painful, um, then obviously it's going to cause some issues. So um, you can see the size of these exaggerated transverse ridges. You know, that's not normal. We said that horses should have ridges, but they shouldn't be that large. You can see another transverse ridge. And then if you go the other side of the mouth, this is where we had lots of issues. Really, really nasty food packing, really, really deep pockets. You can see the size of these overgrowths um, and um, really, really kind of roots exposed on the teeth. Really nasty pocket. And then obviously, of course, this really, really large overgrowth so with really, really, really big ulcerations. So she was in a lot of pain. So we've been working on her a while, but you know, the first examination, of course, it was a matter of kind of looking to see where we can really, really help her. We x-rayed all the teeth. We found actually that she had a really, really nasty infection on the one tooth on the left-hand side, which was not surprising because we knew we had a lot of food packing around it. And it was actually, that was one of the teeth that was quite overgrown. So she's probably been trying to avoid chewing on it. But even with the radiograph, you can see this kind of jagged appearance of a teeth. She just didn't have any proper teeth to really occlude on. And then once again, the same thing, that tooth on the right that um, was very, very bad food packing. We actually just had to extract that tooth because it had really, really bad gum disease. But she actually kind of technically had four teeth I could have extracted. But obviously, we have to extract the essential ones and see how we can help her. And we've seen her a few times since. She's got a lot better. But 
you know, once you get to this point, it, it takes a lot of work to get their teeth back to normal. And she's, you know, she's obviously um, with much better owners now who are feeding her. So she's looking a lot better. But we are we are still having to manage her and do her teeth on a regular basis to try and correct all these years and years of, of irregular wear and, and, you know, disease and things. Um, right. <laughs> OK, well, I think that's probably a good time to stop. Uh, because we do want to leave some time for questions, although we've got a couple more cases here. But I think we'll pass back to, I'm going to leave it on this lovely picture of this big Clydesdale. <laughs> that was a pretty impressive case. Um, so we'll, I think we'll pass back to you, Gabby, and then we'll see what we've got in the way of questions. Yeah, thank you so much. That's been really, really informative. I always learn, I always feel like I learn something new whenever I listen to you. But we've had loads of really good questions, so I will... Um, get started on them. So pretty straightforward one to start with. So you mentioned obviously the use of equine dental technicians as well as vets, um, but where would horse owners be able to go to check the credentials of their equine dental technician? So the best place to start is the BADT website. I think it's just www.badt.com and that will display a list of members of the BADT. And that would definitely be a good place to start. The Worldwide Association is the other sort of designated Category 2 group. Uh, I don't know if they have a register, actually. So apologise to WW if I they do. I believe there is a list on their website There is a list well. on their website. Yeah, so that would be definitely worth checking out as well. Um, other than that, you have to be really careful because there are some groups. Um, I'm not going to mention any of their names, uh, but there are some that you can just buy membership without actually sitting an exam or doing any training or qualification and call yourself a sort of ordinary member rather than being a qualified member. Um, and of course, we have seen some qualifications from other countries, which we can't verify um, to the level or whatever. So we would definitely say if you're going to use a dental technician, then absolutely BADT or, 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 or WW. Perfect. So sticking to um, the use of EDTs, we've got a question around someone who use an, uses an equine dental technician um, and obviously so currently their horse isn't sedated for the exam. Um, this is something they are kind of hoping to look at in terms of having their horse sedated, but they want to know, will their equine dental technician likely work with a vet who would like sedate the horse um, or would the vet have to perform the dental check if they wanted the horse to be sedated? Want to take that or me? <laughs> you can take that. So, yeah, so we do want to make it clear that there are some really skilled dental technicians out there. And I, to be honest, I don't know how some of them are so good at doing that routine rasping with the horses unsedated. They are, you know, they really, really are good. Um, and uh, but e even the best, even the best dental technicians. And I, I spent the first fifteen years of my career rasping teeth unsedated, and I've spent the last twenty years only doing it under sedation and the reason for that is that no matter how good you get at rasping more often than not you can't do a thorough examination so i think there's a choice with routine rasping um dental technician or or a vet that's good at doing that um but i do think increasingly with what we see day in day out that every horse owner should have an oroscopic examination under sedation every so often not quite sure what that time interval should be, but maybe every third or fourth time that the horse has routine dentistry. At some point, I think that style, that type of examination is critically important. And I think it's a it's a good thing to then describe this as a dental team, because I think whoever does that examination can then feed back to the dental technician um, who's doing the routine dentistry and say, look, actually, we've got in fundibular caries of these teeth, we've got a diastema here developing. Um, you may decide to treat it there and then, you may decide to monitor it, but you can give the dental technician a kind of prescription, if you like, for what to look out for in the future. And I think that's where we should be heading, rather than just going, you know, year in, year out, just rasping and maybe, maybe missing some important things. Definitely. So, a question around one of the case studies we looked at around the um, the racehorse who had been fed and had the diastema. 
Hmm. They're asking around examples of the sharp food that this racehorse was maybe fed, which could have caused the bad cheek ulceration. Yeah, that's a very good. Uh, I'm not going to answer all the questions. It's just that was my case. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, that's a good question, actually. And um, what was happening, he was eating his bed a lot, I think. He was on straw. Oh, okay. And I think he was eating a lot of straw. Um, one of the best ways to avoid that particular problem is to not feed chaff based um, diets. Um, we find that sometimes these are marketed for older horses um and they're very stalky even things like alfalfa chopped alfalfa can be very stalky so what you want to do if you've got any feed like that you want to put your hand in it and feel it if it feels very sharp and stalky and sticks into your skin it's probably not going to be very good for the teeth if you've got a normal horse that's not got any problems at all they can cope with that kind of feed absolutely fine but as soon as they start to get any problems and sometimes older horses will be predisposed to these gaps then you really want to avoid feeding any of these more stalky feeds, anything that's straw based. So there's a few diets out there that are based on chopped straw and alfalfa um, to try and stop them from being such good doers sometimes. Um, but mm -hmm. to eat those diets, they need to have kind of perfect teeth, really. So we generally av av advise avoiding those in many cases, certainly ones that we see as referrals. We're often taking horses off those diets and putting them onto soaked complete cubes and grass and soft hay and, and good quality haylage. Now, also, they're just, you know, also be careful of your muesli mixes. They often contain a bit of kind of chopped alfalfa in it. And they have the added thing that very often they're coated with molasses. So we're not big fans of those as far as teeth are concerned. We do feel that they um, yeah, could potentially aggravate any underlying dental disease as well. Polos, polos are usually OK. <laughs> Everybody asks us, should we not feed polos? And they're actually normally fine because as long as they follow up with hay, that's what cleans their teeth normally, just eating hay. So well, the odd polo mint's fine. Pop tip. The odd, the odd, <laughs> the odd polo mint, yeah. Um, so... We obviously talk around the importance of routine dental checks um, at least once a year. Um, what would kind of make you change your mind on how often you'd want to see a horse? So if it was going to six monthly or even three monthly instead of that yearly checkup? Okay, yeah. So <laughs> it, it varies. Well, first of all, you've got an age thing. We know that horses, um, you know, things change as their age as well. So we, you know, Chris showed right at the beginning, we know that horses over 15 years of age are very, very likely to have some form of dental disease, whether it be something minor that can be treated on one-off or something that, that needs um, more kind of uh, ongoing treatment. And definitely, um, there's definitely a tendency towards as horses get older um, that they should be checked more regularly. So we often get horses being checked, you know, once they get kind of over 16, 17 years of age, thinking about every six, nine months maximum, really, they should be treated. But it also depends on individual horses. You know, we get young horses that get presented to us that have um, teeth that are slightly out of alignment. They may have had an, a tooth that was extracted in the past. They may have an extra tooth. Sometimes some horses just don't have great teeth. Sometimes they develop cracks and little fractures. So once you've identified a horse that potentially might have some issues, they, they we often recommend doing more regular treatment. And very often more regular treatment will mean that we manage those conditions and you prevent them from progressing and actually developing serious dental disease. So there is a lot of variation. But um, and also, I would say but kind young of young horses, just from the rasping point of view. Yeah, so young horses often get sharp very quickly. So very often, up till they get to about seven or eight years of age, we would recommend probably you know um, more frequently than twelve months, probably six months in those kind of cases. And then also, I think it also depends on the type of breed. Some breeds are more sensitive. Depends on what the horse does, you know, um, you know, if you're asking your horse, for example, like a dressage horse, um, you know, we're asking quite a lot of them. It's quite a lot of sensitive things that we're expecting of them, a lot of sensitive feedback from when you're riding them. Those kind of cases, you know, most of our competition horses we're doing every six to nine months and we don't switch them out to 12 months. Right. OK. Interestingly, there where you mentioned breeds, we've had a question in around the kind of the type of breed of horse and are there breeds that are more prone to dental problems that you find or research is telling us? Arabs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, there's different, different. We love Arabs. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the, 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 the yeah, the yeah. picture of the client, all your large breeds, they tend to have quite large jaws. So sometimes the teeth don't push together. So they tend to be more prone to getting um, diastemas, periodontal disease. They often also more uh, commonly have extra teeth, which also predisposes them. 
Um, miniature horses. Yeah, miniature horses, the teeth are overcrowded. Little Welsh ponies often have t teeth missing, a sort of condition called hypodontia, where there's one or two absent. Um, and certainly the the, the sort of the, the real miniature horses, not so much. Shetlands can sometimes get bad, not that I'm saying they're, 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 they're small pony breed, not so much like those miniature horses, but they Shetland ponies and small ponies can get problems because just I think sometimes people find them a little bit difficult to rasp and sometimes they can sort of stand up on their back legs and do that sort of circus act and that can make it a little bit difficult so they do sometimes get neglected but they don't necessarily have more problems than other horses but miniature horses they definitely do um, and there's a nice study wasn't there just recently published about the prevalence of dental disease in miniature horses. Yeah and then also you get certain some Welsh section ponies get the cemental hyperplasia yeah. of the infundibular. So we often see them with infundibular cases. Multiple, multiple ca cavities in multiple teeth. Yeah. yeah, so that's definitely a developmental or genetic kind yeah. of defect that they get. I remember going to do some an extraction and fillings of a, of a Welsh pony and I, I noticed the pony was missing some teeth and I said to the owner, oh, has he had a, he's obviously lost a few teeth. Do you know what happened to those? And she took four teeth out of her pocket that had all split in half. And she had kept them and taped, tied them together with elastic bands. And she said, oh, yeah, I've got them all with me to show you. And they all had the infundibular caries cavities, all of them. Oh, OK, interesting. There you go. Yeah. Um, around age of teeth now. So is there an age um, that horses run out of teeth? So we know, obviously, that they're constantly erupting from um, what you've gone through. So is there an age that horses will run out of teeth? And then secondary to that, do horses have sensation in the whole of their tooth? Yeah, so two two really good questions. And the age that they normally expire or sort of run out of tooth, which is a good way of putting it actually, is usually between 25 and 35. Um, 25 to 30, sort of late 20s really, sort of 29, 30, 31, 32, that's sort of the age. And it does kind of fit with the lifespan of the horse. So um it's it's kind of built sort of pre-programmed almost so that's that's about when they're going to run out of teeth at the end of their life as far as are they sensitive and can they feel things well there's two things regarding the way that horses eat first of all they're very very good at filter feeding with their muzzles and their lips um and even the hairs on their nose you know i should ideally you shouldn't trim those off they're very good at sensing what they're eating and then you've got two systems you've got the periodontal ligament which is a very good sort of proprioceptive and sensitive system that, that senses pressure applied to the surface of the teeth. And then you've got the sensitivity of the dentine itself, which, which communicates directly with the nerves of the tooth. So um, if you drill too far into a horse's tooth, it'll definitely feel it. Um, and um, it will definitely be able to sense what it's eating. This old thing about, oh, the horse probably broke its tooth because it chewed on a stone probably not really what happens because they they're very good at filter feeding for the most part and certainly not in their best interest from an evolutionary point of view to chew on stones and break their teeth so we think they're actually very good at avoiding doing that for the most part Brilliant. and i guess where you talk about it the um the tooth when it, we would say it would run out around 25 to 35 i guess now with yeah. horses they're living so much longer now as well so it's just so important that that's why we really do protect their teeth because if they are getting to yeah the age of 35 they need to make sure we need to make sure that and that's they've that's another thing about about rasping and over rasping and um you know we think the horse's tooth in on average is about 90 to 100 mil in length um, and there's a little bit of elongation that occurs when they're sort of three, two, three, four years of age, but that's pretty much it. And they're erupting and wearing down at two to three millimetres a year. Um, and if we then rasping down, you know, more and more on the surface, we're potentially removing their longevity, really. We're eating into that tooth that they really need. So, um, but, it, but uh, you know, we do have a problem with some 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 people rasping a little bit too much but we also have some real problems with people not rasping enough and mm. i'll be honest some of the some of the most the worst cases of neglect i've seen have been overseas where they don't have trained dental technicians i think actually in the uk now situation is vastly different to it was 20 years ago we have a lot of really good dental technicians who are rasping teeth really well it's pretty rare for us to see these 
awful cases of neglect where the teeth have just never been rasped. So, yeah, well, that's positive at least. Yeah, that's really positive. So obviously the whole message around our campaign is no pain, check again. Um, so we've got a question around kind of pain identification. So we know obviously that horses are stoic animals, so they maybe aren't showing us signs of pain. Um, but we've got a question around kind of pain identification and kind of technology. So they're asking whether there are studies in the equine field um, similar to research that there's been conducted on nonverbal human pain behaviours that investigate indicators of pain in horses, um, utilising kind of machine learning or AI models for identification. Are you aware of any of that coming through in our industry? Yeah. Oh, we've, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, no, definitely. And we, we're sort of trying to keep up with the research on that where we can. Um, and there's been sort of 23 kind of indicators of, of, of different facial recognition or facial patterns from horses that are in various degrees of pain. And um, that that's something that is being very thoroughly researched. And um, when I, I do a nice a lecture on this and show some of these images of horses with the sort of so-called pain face and it's being it is being assessed more and i think there's there's like certainly in in humans and other we can we can use even iphone apps to recognize certain facial features that you wouldn't be able to tell with the naked eye as it were um looking at autism and things like that for example um and so this is definitely coming but we have to be really careful what we're looking at and there's a really nice paper that i've that I often show people at conferences where there's a horse that's got an exact replica of the pain face and I ask everyone to put their hands up having given them a bit of training in how to recognize it and everyone puts their hand up and says oh yeah it's definitely in pain you know it's got its ears back it's got its eyes tight and all the rest of it but it's actually a horse that was asleep during the controlled trial in this study um, so um, we have to be really careful and the other thing with dental pain is that it might only be painful whilst the horse bites on it so if we consider ourselves with toothache, mm. it's often only when you bite on something that you know you've got a bad tooth. Yes, it can be excruciating. Yes, it can be all the time, but it might not be all the time. It might be why the horse is altering its eating pattern to cope. So we, we're focusing more on using those kind of technologies to assess horses' mastication patterns to demonstrate that they're eating in an abnormal way and therefore avoiding experiencing pain. So those horses probably won't demonstrate those kind of facial recognition patterns, maybe. But it's yeah. a good question. A lot of research still to do on that. Um, but I think we we need to also remember how the pain is experienced as far as the teeth are concerned. But this is yeah. kind of this is what we say, you know, when um, I always say we, we were often doing detective work. And very often, if it's not obvious that the horse is chewing in an odd fashion, when we do the oral exam, the clues are there. You know, like yeah. you said, it, it, you know, tiny little focal overgrowth and, um, you know, adjacent to an area of this pain, food staining we're seeing. Um, I had a horse recently. Asymmetric, yeah. Yeah, asymmetric chewing, chronic. And I've recently had a horse, we, we occasionally see this where the horse suddenly develops an acute pain, which means a sudden onset and severe pain. And they literally do not chew on that side of the, the um, the mouth at all, for, whether it even just be a few hours or days, and they quickly develop this slimy plaque layer over the surface of the tooth, and you can actually see that kind of, an, and they develop quite a smell in the mouth. So, well, um, that's the only sign, isn't it? Yes, that's the only sign pain. that you see that they're painful on that side. Um, so, you know, I always say the clues are there; we just have to look for them. Yeah, no, definitely. We've got a question based around EOTRH. So mm -hmm. this lady's um, horse currently has um, they they currently have they're suffering with this in their right um, front right incisor. Um, they're not currently too bad, well, but is there any way to prevent it getting worse? No. No. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's a progressive disease. I mean, I, I'm. So I'm pretty sure that it must be involving more than the one. Yeah, I'm assuming she's been told that the one is particularly bad, but you know, okay. it doesn't normally just affect. It normally affects all the the, the incisors, or at least all yeah. the upper and all the lower. But there'll be there'll be a variation because within the same horse, some teeth might be mildly affected and some severely, yeah. and and we just never know because sometimes you can identify a horse with mild EOTRH and then you re-examine it six months later and it's gone. 
beyond severe and sometimes horses can kind of it can grumble on and be slowly progressive so unfortunately there's nothing we can do to stop it or slow it down but we can monitor it and react to when it becomes severe or painful yeah and you you can give you know people you can give antibiotics for a short period of time not that we would mm -hmm. recommend that necessarily you can give painkillers to help with that you can give mouthwashes and you can do things that will help to alleviate the symptoms if you like um and but but the underlying disease is like a train rolling down the tracks there's nothing you can do that we know of so far with any research that will even slow down the pro the progress and, of and that disease underlying and just that you know kind of this disease has been the the basis of the disease tooth resorption has been recognized in humans for more than a hundred years. So there's been human studies for more than a hundred years and they still they don't, can't know, do anything in humans they still don't know exactly what sets it off. Why do some people have it? Why do some people not? And when they identify it, they can't stop that process. So I think, you know, the chances of us finding some, you know, well, the, exactly. If we could find something, <laughs> yeah. we could then start doing this in humans and we'd be multi-multi-millionaires. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But it's important to say that actually because there are some companies out there who will sell supplements that might have some anti-inflammatory properties in other things um and they'll say oh yeah this is the this is the supplement you need for eotrh there, there right. is definitely nothing that works for that okay no it's very no, really helpful to clear it up like you say it is yeah something that maybe people aren't aware of um, so we, obviously throughout we've spoken quite a lot about um, extractions that you've performed um, or seen. So if a horse has um, a molar removed, how often should they um, then have a routine check kind of regarding potential overgrowth from opposing molars? And then just in relation to extract extraction, we have another question which is around the healing time. So do you heal um, what do you do to heal the gum that's left when extracting teeth? <laughs> you want to take it? Me take it. Um, so yeah, so once they've got obviously got a tooth missing, the tooth opposite um, will start to overgrow. So generally we would say in a minimum every six months. Sometimes when it's a young horse after the extraction, there might be kind of a little bit of a super eruption or the overgrowth becomes quite large quickly. Um, but generally most of the ones um, six monthly is, is usually enough to keep that in check. If we are faced with the horse with a particularly large overgrowth, we will often rasp a little bit and recommend that they come back in six to eight weeks later and do a little bit more and gradually kind of take the tooth down until it's level with the other teeth. As far as for healing, if it's a straightforward oral extraction, and in fact, the majority of our extraction cases, really, they're completely healed within four to six weeks. Um, mm -hmm. Really, it's the first seven to ten days that they might be a bit painful, a bit like us when we've had a tooth extraction. Usually by about two weeks, we're happy for them to be ridden again. There's no reason not to ride them unless it's a tooth that's at the front that might have contact. So after we've extracted the tooth, you've obviously got a really deep socket. So we normally um, pack that with a little bit of a, a light packing. We sometimes, if it's a, a young horse, put a little bit of a, a putty type of plug on the surface. But we never pack anything deep in that socket because that will slow down the healing. Horses are actually really, really good with healing. You know, we don't we don't really have to worry. And um, yeah, and the other thing is, is we actually very, very rarely give them antibiotics. You yeah, know, okay. when, you, when you're extracting the tooth, um, you, you've now removed the source of infection and obviously we, we, we're really careful you know especially as a veterinary profession there's a really big drive to be very careful with our um, antibiotic use because we've got to save what antibiotics we have because of all bacterial resistance so there really is a kind of a, a push not to use antibiotics unless you have to and, and 80 90 percent of our cases we wouldn't even give antibiotics no. only in kind of maybe a Cushing's pony or if it was a particularly bad extraction or if you feel there's infected bone or something like that we might in give antibiotics so Pretty yeah and you know even when they do the socket socket changes the socket might smell once you flush it out it's often beautiful and clean underneath it so so uh, I had a tooth extracted myself <laughs> Uh, a couple of years ago and after about three weeks it was pretty it, <laughs> it was a bit smelly and a little bit sore so I took a camera picture with my oroscope camera sent it to my dentist on whatsapp and I said because he's a friend of mine and I said look I need antibiotics I've got this smelly socket and he was like 
don't be stupid. You do not you need antibiotics. Just flush it out and it will be fine. What do you do with your horses? And I was like, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and it was absolutely fine. So, yeah. I could be your own dentist, Chris. There you go. Exactly. It's like <laughs> heal thyself, physician. <laughs> I'm conscious of time, but I have got yeah. a couple more questions no, um, that I'd like to ask, if that's OK. Yeah. So we've had actually quite a few, which is really nice to see people saying that they're either in the middle of training um, to be an equine dental technician or they're looking yeah. to progress and begin yeah. their training maybe next year. So just if there's any advice that you could both give regarding training and progressing through the industry. Yeah, there's um, so there used to be a degree course at Hartbury College um, and unfortunately that finished oh, quite a few good number of years ago now. That was a three year degree course in equine dental science. And I have heard that that may be coming back as a sort of foundation degree at Hartbury again, maybe next year. But I don't know that for, for definite. But in any case, that that does a very good sort of basic scientific background behind it. But it doesn't do that much in the way of the practical training. Um, and it's a, it's a very practical subject. It's, as I say, it's a little bit like farriery. If you ask anyone to take a show off, it might take them ages, but you watch a farrier do it, they do it in their sleep, you know, in 10 seconds. Um, and so it's farrier is a very skilled um, thing. And so, so is rasping teeth. It takes a long time to learn to do it really well and really properly. And um, the best way to do it is through an apprenticeship without question. So the best thing is to try and find somebody, um, a, a sort of VADT member who will be um, happy to take take you on as an apprentice um, and then um, yeah that's 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 basically it really there's not really any other way um, you can go on weekend courses and things like that but you, you know they're, they're not gonna they're not gonna equip you to do the job properly they're, they really aren't you really need to do it as an apprenticeship and it will take years to become really proficient at rasping teeth mm. no perfect um, and then finally, I've had quite a nice question, which I think will round off the webinar quite nicely. <laughs> so if you could both do one thing for the horse or recommend to horse owners for good dental health, what would it be? One thing. One thing. Yeah, one thing, <laughs> if you can narrow it down. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to say an oroscopic examination every now and again. Just as yep. I said before, I wouldn't want to put a definite time scale on that. Um, but I think during the horse's life, it is good to have. I mean, the ideal situation, we do that every time. But, you know, even when we're sedating horses, we don't use an oroscope on every exam. We we'll always use a mirror and a light. But I think that that style of exam, when you're look at, looking at the horse's mouth so closely under sedation, I do think that's a really good thing for it to have now and again. Not saying it needs it every time, but if a horse has never had one of those types of examinations, it would be a pretty good idea. So that's what I think would be the best thing to really help the horse. But it needs to be someone who knows what they're looking at. Yeah. Um, again, you can't just buy an horoscope and think you're going to be able to diagnose everything because, again, you need to know really what you're really what you're looking at. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think for me, and I think this is really kind of one of the messages we wanted to give with this campaign, I think that people are aware of what they should expect at a dental exam and I think it's important for owners to either be there when the horse is having the dental exam or else have somebody there that they can trust because I think still too often we get oh yeah yeah my horse's teeth were done they weren't there somebody was at the yard they went came and did all the horses and actually you know and and you know do you know if your horse has really had a good job you know do you know if somebody's actually did they open the mouth did they have a gag did they wash the mouth out did they look in the mouth I mean very often people go oh my horse always has his teeth unsedated but for all you know the horse is whirring around and you know throwing his head up so you know as we said I'm not saying all horses need to be sedated but sometimes owners have actually never seen their horses having their teeth done and actually don't know what to expect and think it's normal for the horse to kind of be pulling them around and nobody actually having a look in the mouth. So I think um, if every horse owner can arm themselves with the knowledge of what they should expect, because unfortunately the mouth is not something that they can look in, so they they don't know whether, whether somebody's done a good job or not. And that's unfortunately... Um, one of the big frustrations of of dentistry really yeah yeah no I agree and I think even um 
speaking to people and owners actually they're probably they're actually not aware of what to expect when I've spoke to them about what they should be seeing it's actually they haven't actually seen that in practice so I think yeah that's a really important message to get out um and like you said Chris with the um the, the osteo check with when we said that it's just even being able to give that to yeah. to their equine dental technician even if they have the vet do that and then they have their equine dental technician has something else to refer to it's just going to help yeah and we have general, I have it? to say you know that we, we're probably a bit biased because of all, all of our case population the ones that have all these awful problems there's probably loads of horses out there that you know getting very nicely rasped that don't have these problems but all the studies show us that if you just look at 100 horses you'll find 90 percent of them with problems so yeah they, they, they definitely are out there but I don't know how some of the dental technicians find the things that they find and some 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 of the best dental technicians that we have that recommend us to their clients and owners um they often don't quite know what they're looking at they'll just say I examined this horse today and I saw a black hole on the Mm. back tooth and I know that's not normal he was moving around a bit I couldn't quite see it was but I would like him oroscoped and then we'll have a look at that and then we'll send the horse back to the dental technician to carry on with the care whether we've treated it or not but at least everybody then knows exactly what's going on it might just be a monitoring case it might be that we recommend an extraction or anything in between so Mm. I think that just shows again shows like you said in the presentation that whole working relationship yeah exactly so everybody just working as a team communicating understand who's doing what and the limitations of each you know that's the thing so yeah perfect well thank you so much that's been like excellent I'm so happy um and I hope everyone's been able to to get something really useful out of that I know I have um just a reminder to everyone watching this has been recorded and it will be sent out um as soon as possible um so you can re-watch um and catch up on anything that you want to go over um and again another little plug for our dental awareness pack uh this is, can be downloaded from bhs.org.uk slash teeth and there's lots more information in there as well and a routine planner that you can print off to keep a check of your horse's dental routine so hopefully you can keep them up to date um but thank you so much again chris and nicole it's been fantastic to pleasure. have you right, real pleasure. Um, yeah, and yeah so thank you for supporting yeah. dental awareness week everyone Okay, take care, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye.